Hi, my name is Pete Scazzaro. I want to welcome you today to the Emotionally Healthy Leader Podcast. So good to be with you. Today's theme is one thing no leader wants, but every leader needs. While every Christian, and especially every Christian leader, desperately needs uh, this we're going to talk about today, you will not find it really as a topic on any leadership conferences or even Christian conferences uh, because it's just so radical. It's so outside the box. It's box. It's so countercultural. And yet it's one of the foundational qualities of kingdom life according to Jesus. In fact, it's one of the distinctives of who we are that makes us followers and especially leaders for Jesus and making us distinct from the rest of the world. Now, I'm not going to say anything else about it except that it's one of the Beatitudes of Jesus from Matthew chapter 5. So as our, as our free resource this week, let me invite you to download our ebook called Discover Sabbath Delight because I think it's a wonderful companion to the topic. Just go to emotionallyhealthy.org slash Sabbath because slowing down for Sabbath delight will soften us with the love of God and tame us a bit. So now let me invite you to listen in on this message. I'm simply calling today, one thing no leader wants, but every leader needs. Enjoy. All right, Matthew 5, verse 3. Okay, verse 3. Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So let's one of the first three here. Okay, we've done blessed are the poor in spirit. Everybody, blessed are the poor in spirit we've done. Blessed are those who mourn. And today we're going to do Blessed are the meek. All right, so I hope that as we move along with these uh, Beatitudes, that you're going to memorize them along the way. Meditate on them at home and during the week and, and catch a bit of the depth and profoundness of what they're about. And, and uh, because the Beatitudes are so different than the way the world functions, and the way we live in our world, it's, like, it's kind of like learning a whole other language. All right, so this week is blessed are those who, blessed are the poor in spirit, number one. Blessed are those who mourn, and today is blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The word for meek in the dictionary is compliant. The dictionary defines meek as this. Someone who's compliant, who has no spirit, who evidences little courage, and who's overly submissive. And now again, you've got to catch the, the, the wallop or the shock of when Jesus says, as he announces, this is what my kingdom is about. This is, what, this is true spirituality. This is such a shock. This is, this is meant to like be a slap you across the like, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. I mean, it's not what anyone's looking for. And I'll give you a bookstore today, like a Barnes & Noble or Borders. I mean, here's the kind of books on the shelf. Leadership lessons from Attila the Hun. <laughs> nice girls don't get rich. 48 Laws of Power. Or here's a great book for parents. Stop negotiating with your teen Strategies for parenting your angry, manipulative, and moody, and depressed adolescent. I like that. Our, our, uh, the, the PS41, the elementary school that my uh, youngest daughter attends, had a seminar that we attended that was called Strategies for Defending Yourself for, for the Girls Against Bullies. In the elementary, it was quite a seminar. And uh, I mean, just think about it. I don't know if you have to driving lessons in New York, but like learning to drive in New York City or, or like just, just, just tackle the BQE on a day of traffic, you know, or the Cross Bronx. And I mean, it is not for the meek of hearts. And uh, I mean, even if you ever bought a house or a condominium, you know, or a co-op, you know the war uh, or have involved in anything, you know, going for a parking space. I mean, I was at, I was at um, BJ's going for a park. It was, it was a war. I mean... Not being aggressive, you will, you'll, I'd still be driving around BJ's, you know? <laughs> but, I mean, you're not going to see in Forbes magazine, you know, the hundred, a hundred, the hundred meekest people on earth, you know, as being, you know, the ones they want to interview. And so we don't like meek. I mean, it doesn't do much for us. Coaches don't rally their team. All right, everybody, you're going to go out there, you know, and be meek, you know? And, uh, you know, executives don't get a sales force, you know, and say, okay, now you're going to go out and sell our product and you be meek. I mean... You, know, you don't think of politicians, you know, getting elected for being meek. 
and running on that platform, or, or even generals to their troops. Say, okay, we're going to go to war now. Now you be meek. Or uh, even parenting, that you're going to parent your children by teaching them to go be meek in the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting. You know, we don't, we don't have meekness training seminars. Uh, and if you want to get things done, uh, you, you don't think about hiring somebody meek. I mean, I, mean, I think, of, think of the Beatitudes, you know, getting things done. I want somebody who's overly confident. I want someone who's like, yeah, I can do it, you know. And I, I think of someone going, you go for a loan at the bank. Uh, I don't want someone, you know, being like, uh, I'm at the end of my rope, but I'm com- completely dependent. I'm so broken. You know, someone who's poor in spirit. I mean, you won't get the loan. Or, you know, if you go for a job interview and say, why should I hire, hire, hire you for this job? And they'll say, you know what, I feel like I am, just, I am just a beggar, you know, I am just poor in spirit, you know. I mean, you're not going to, I mean, the guy's not going to get hired or the woman's not going to get hired. Or, you know, think of blessed are those who mourn. I mean, the people who make it in our world are, are the optimistic ones who always have a spin that's going to work out okay. And that not the mourners, you know, mourning, mourners, blessed are those who mourn, someone who doesn't, who doesn't fake it, doesn't pretend, doesn't try to play God, doesn't act like everything's just fine, who's not trying to act, always be in control. Uh, it's a person who's very much in touch with pain, suffering, grieves it, okay, doesn't, very vulnerable, very human, very much in reality. I mean, I think of, excuse me, regardless of your position on the Iraq war and what's going on there, um, you, can, you can say, yeah, bam, you know, people are dying, but, you know, we're getting that war done, we're bringing democracy to the Middle East. I mean, you have an optimistic, you know, not blessed are those who mourn attitude. There's, but there's another attitude saying, you know, war is an incredible tragedy. I mean, people dying is something to grieve, you know, what goes on there on a daily basis. And uh, regardless of your political view, it is a tragedy, just war in general and what's happening there. And, you know, or again, I, I, was, I was at the Midwest this past week and I was doing a conference and I turned on a Christian television station and uh, it was pretty alarming, you know, and I was, you know, I can tell you this, blessed are those who mourn was not like the theme. Uh, it was definitely, you know, it was the optimistic. It was the, you know, we were changing the world. And I said, I thought to myself, this is maybe a better way to raise money. You know, it's, you know, blessed are the optimistic, you know, who can see it all happen. And then you got, you know, the aggressive, you know, we have blessed are the meek, you know, and uh, our world's into aggression. And, uh, you know, I think of someone like Robert Moses who built all the highways, you know, a lot of the highways in New York City, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. I mean, he was highly aggressive. He plowed through neighborhoods. I mean, there wouldn't be the highways that we drive on. It wasn't for a guy who was so aggressive. He just moved thousands of people out of their houses. That was the end of that. You know, or I think of someone like Trump. You know, I don't think tr- Trump is not exactly on the meek scale. Um, or if you're going to hire a lawyer, if, you, if you've hired a lawyer, do you want a meek lawyer representing you? Uh, so, again, this is not a very popular teacher. Let's, let's, we've got to look at this and say, this is how Jesus announces to everybody, this is my family, this is my kingdom, this is what it's about. In fact, the meek are going to inherit the whole earth. You're saying, I think you're crazy. I mean, this is not what it's about. Poverty of spirit, blessed are the mourn, and blessed are the meek. I mean, in Jesus' day, they didn't like this either. Because, understand, they were saying, this will never work. You will get killed if you do this. You are not in the real world, Jesus. I mean, remember, that the Israel at that point had lived under domination, and control of the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, and now the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, again, who controlled all of Palestine at that, at that time, these, were no, these, weren't, these weren't jokesters. When, King, when the Emperor Titus came to Jerusalem in 70 AD, he massacred a million Jews. Imagine, a million Jews, he just massacred them in 70 AD. These people weren't playing. And here's Jesus saying, and the people who the Jews loved were the zealots who were saying, we are going to overthrow Rome. And these were the ones who were into violence, and the people loved the zealots. And so, in fact, they wanted Jesus to be the Messiah who was going to clean this place up and get this thing right. And here he's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. And um, I can just see him say to Jesus, Jesus, this is the real world. You are in la-la land. And he says, blessed are the, are the meek for they will inherit the earth. You'll be the gift to the earth. So obviously, Jesus is meant, it's meant to shock us, turn our world upside down. And I pray that we can all get it this morning and leave here, uh, really having met Jesus, and again, not a Jesus that we've created in our own minds. Because this is the living God revealing who he is and what the nature of his kingdom is all about. So the nature of the, these, these Beatitudes is you end up having to do a word study because Jesus very specifically chose words, that he could have chosen other words to make his point. So for example, in poverty of spirit, I'm sorry, I forgot the picture. You've got the beggar who's absolutely stripped of everything at the end of his resources, not just the poor person, but the poverty of spirit. I got nowhere else to go. I am so broken, so dependent. I am, if God doesn't deliver me, I'm going to die. He says, that's the entrance way to the kingdom. 
That is what life in the kingdom is all about. That's what it means to be a Christian. You live like that. Pretty heavy. You're that broken. And then you're a person who mourns. And and again, there's nine words for mourning. He put the most extreme one. Someone who truly feels the depth of their own sin, the sadness of the world, but yet they walk in a joy because they've embraced it. They're vulnerable. They're broken. They realize they're not in control. They've let go, and they grieve the fact that God is God, and they're not. And then following that, now he goes into the meek. A byproduct of poverty of spirit, brokenness. A byproduct of mourning is this thing called meekness. And now we're getting into relationships with other people, a brokenness that now affects others. So here's the, here, here's the three images, okay? Okay, the first is, there's three ways it was used in ancient Greece, in ancient Greek, okay? The first was, you got to think of a wild horse. You ever seen a wild horse in a movie? I know, it's really hard because none of us have horses, you know, in New York. Maybe you do. I, don't, I haven't seen one in Queens recently. But um, you got to picture, it comes with the image of power under control. So you think of a wild horse, okay, that's not been tamed. Okay, that, some of you may be like wild horses. You've got power, but you're wild. And so a wild horse, you can't ride it. It kicks over fences, will bite your head off. Uh, Wild horses are dangerous. People that have not been broken by a trainer or or by by God, horses that have not been broken by a trainer Um, are power and energy out of control. And um, you can't ride an unbroken horse. As Jesus is saying, a meek person is like a horse that's been broken. And the second is, kind of rides on that, is it's used as a soothing medicine. And uh, I think I had a shoulder problem uh, a couple of months, a month ago, a couple of months ago, and and, uh, I was just in terrific pain. And I'll never forget, just taking, I took some Motrin. So I was like, take Motrin. And I was like, gone. And uh, the issue of a meek person, when you're with someone who's meek, they are like a soothing medicine. Do you ever take medicine and you get sicker? A person who's not meek, when you're with them and you're in pain, you're worse when you're finished. Just like they're a wild horse that kicks you over. But a meek person has got power under control and they function like a soothing medicine. And then thirdly, they're like a gentle breeze. Okay, they're just like, oh, I have a hot day. We've been here on hot days, right, in this room. And it's, it's, it's 90 degrees in here. And if you're sitting where Nelson is, you get the fan on, you're like, ah, oh, the fan, you know. It's a gentle breeze. Or if you're on a porch on a hot summer day, you know, at the beach, you just love that breeze. A person who's not meek is like a hurricane. Okay, they knock over your house. Okay, they got, they, 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 they got wind, all right. And uh, they're 100 miles an hour. And uh, they could possibly kill you. Now, a good way of looking at this is, is I, I look at it like this way. If you, if, if you think of a seesaw, blessed are the meek, you're not, a meek person is not a, a, is not a doormat with no self. If you don't have a sense of self, and we'll talk about this in a minute, you're not meek. If you're a doormat and weak and spineless, that is not the Bible's definition of meek that Jesus is talking about here, as you'll see in just a few minutes. And the other extreme is you got someone who's arrogant and dominant, okay, which is, uh, of course, not meek as well. And then you've got some people, it's the opposite. The arrogant and dominant is the bigger one, and no self doormats on the bottom. But many of us, we go from one extreme to the other. Sometimes we're a doormat. Other times we kill people. No, we explode on people. But we can't quite figure out this, what is meekness and how does this work? So here's the balance we're trying to look for is this. We're trying to get this even keel to be like a tame horse, power under control, a soothing medicine, a gentle breeze. That's what we want to be by the grace of God. That's what Jesus says. This is what describes my people, my church, my new family. It's not like the world. They're broken. They get out what's going on on the inside. They're able to grieve and they're meek. They're like broken horses. They're gentle breezes. They're soothing medicines. Now, why don't you just, just hold that, and if you have a Bible, I want to illustrate this with a story before I go any further. And it's a story of Moses in Numbers chapter 12. And it's a great story. Now, Moses has got, he's leading two to three million people out of the wilderness, I mean, out of Egypt. He's led them out. They're in the wilderness. They're wandering. And Moses is 80, probably at this point, I'd say he's 81 years old. You get it? Maybe a year has passed. And He's got a sister named Miriam, who is a prophetess, we know, that she's spirit-filled, because we get that from Exodus 15. And he's got a brother named Aaron, who is the high priest. I mean, he's like the big cheese in terms of the new religious order. So he's a, he's a holy guy, too. He's, I mean, he's, got a, he's got some weight. 
And so here's the story here. Miriam and Aaron, chapter 12, verse 1. It says, they began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. For he had married a Cushite. Here's what they said. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now, Moses was a very humble man. In fact, the word there is he was a very meek man. More meek than anyone else on the face of the earth. So I want you to get the scene here. Understand, they begin to talk about Moses. So, so who knows? Miriam and, and, and Aaron, I can just see them like having dinner with some of their people, their leaders under them, and say, you know, you know, and they start talking to their leaders, their friends, their groups, you know, over dinner. And maybe they went right to Moses' tent and like started talking to Moses about, you know, basically things like, you know, Moses, the fact that we're suffering here in the wilderness, wandering in a desert, it's all your fault. In fact, I don't, we don't think you know what you're doing. You don't even have a plan to get us out of here. In fact, Moses, the food here stinks. Manna every day. People are miserable, you know. They were better off in Egypt. In fact, you're probably too old for this job anyway. You know you're 81 years old. And we don't think you've got a grip on leading this group here. And in fact, you lack discernment, Moses, because we are definitely taking the wrong way, long way around this. And you know what? God's been speaking to us too. The Lord's been giving us words about the direction we should go. In fact, you've made some mistakes. In fact, Moses, you know what? I think you're an egomaniac. I think your ego's in this, Moses. You got a control problem. That's why you won't release some of this authority. I mean, they're just going after Moses. I mean, they're, they're creating an incredible split right here. In fact, this is so serious. This is catastrophic, not just for Moses. This is potentially going to destroy all Israel. You've got to see, feel the magnitude of this thing. Moses is like, he didn't sign up for this. He's trying to serve God. The guy has been loyal, faithful. He, I mean... He, he put himself out. He's got the experience, the depth, the wisdom, etc. This is very painful. Have you been hurt by people? Okay, you only can get hurt by people you're close to, whom you love and are loyal to. These are his family members. These are his closest leaders. These are the folks that he is banking on that sir, you know, help him, and they are basically saying, you know, we're out of here. And uh, he is slighted. He is slandered. He is criticized. I mean, I don't know. If I was Moses, not, what would you do if you were Moses? Think about that. You're in the tent. They come to the tent. If they've talked to everybody else, has spread all this poison. Now they come talk to you directly, and you realize, and they start telling you, we think you've messed up. You're an ego man. I think you start questioning everything about you. I mean, I'd say, I, first I'd explode in anger, and I'd yell at them. Get out of here. You know, I'll take your heads off, you know. And, you know, or, okay, call the army right now. Put them in jail, these two creeps. You know, or say, you know what? Hey, all right, you take Israel. I quit. I quit. I don't want to deal with this. I, didn't, I, don't, I don't want this anyway. Or maybe you do a passive-aggressive move. Oh, maybe God's dealing with him. But then you figure out some way to really zing him later, you know. You say, I'll get these guys back. You know, I'll listen to them. Or you know what? Or, or, or you say, I, you hold a grudge and you never trust these people again. You say, okay, I hear you. I, and you know in your heart you've said, never will I trust these bums again. And they are definitely not coming to Christmas dinner, Okay. <laughs> And their kids are not, my nephews and nieces are done with gifts on, on their birthdays. You know, I mean, you, you hold a grudge forever. What sets Moses apart is verse 3. This, this incident comes to him and it says, Moses was more meek or humble than anybody on the face of the earth. And he doesn't, at this point, he doesn't do anything. And um, it says that, at once then the Lord says to Moses. So he waits, and then God speaks to Moses. And I'm sorry, he speaks to Moses and Aaron and Miriam. He says, come on out of the tent of meeting, everybody. Come on out, everybody. And the three, then the Lord then appears in a pillar of cloud, and the Lord says, you know, I speak to Moses face to face. He's, he's faithful in all my house. And uh, why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And he deals with, God himself deals with Miriam and Aaron in his time. And it says, the anger of the Lord burns against them in verse 9 and lefts them. And, then, and the cloud lifts and Miriam gets leprosy. Then Aaron goes to Moses and said, oh, Moses, please pray for her that she might be healed. You know what I would have said? No. No. She needs to feel what she has done. And when I feel like she really learned her lesson, then I will consider a prayer <laughs> as the Spirit leads. 
But for now, I don't feel the Spirit leading. It's just not in me to pray for her. And I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I'm not going to pray. And I think God must be in that too. I mean, now, you know, Moses just, you know, says, he asks her to pray for Miriam, and he clearly just has nothing in him, anger. He just, so he goes, oh God, verse 13, oh God, please heal. And he prays for Miriam, and she's healed. And that's the end of it, and they move on, and they continue to work together. It's quite amazing. You know, one of the, um, you know, Moses didn't learn meekness growing up. I mean, remember who his family was. I saw a prince of Egypt, didn't you? His family was not meek, okay? I mean, the pharaohs and all that. I mean, so he didn't learn this from his family. And because, remember, he murdered somebody. This guy wasn't meek. He killed somebody. So he's already a murderer and a fugitive. So, so what happened? This guy learned meekness. If he didn't get it from his family of origin. I mean, where, where have you seen meekness model? I doubt any of us learned meekness from our families growing up. I know I didn't. I mean, I, I learned, you know, I think of my mother yelling and my father beating us, you know. I mean, a meeting, you know, meekness wasn't exactly a great Italian-American quality that was passed on from generation to generation. And then I thought of my coaches. And I thought, you know, because I played sports, and, and I can just remember my, you know, my most influential coach with a baseball bat after losing a basketball game. And we'd sit there for an hour on the buses. He's banging the seats with the, with the bat in a rage that we lost. And then we went back and had practice, you know, until the 9 o'clock at night. And then I thought of the schoolyard, you know, and, and Tommy Pacheco, you know, beating me to a pulp, you know, and just, you know, and just the war of being a, a young boy trying to grow up and, and be cool, you know, and make my way. And I mean, the world's a mean place out there. I mean, I bought a house in New York. I've got my licks. Hey, I was involved in helping us buy this building. I've taken my bruises. I mean, it's a, it's a mean world out there. And those of you in business know. So this idea of meekness is so foreign to us. I mean, this is, this is another world, everybody. Blessed are the meek. And, uh, and here's Moses here, you know, waiting on God and meek. It allows God to come to his defense. In fact, before I go into how we get there, so, so here's the, you know, Meekness is used in a few different places in the New Testament, but for the sake of time, I'm going to give you just a summarized view. I want you to write it down somewhere. The five qualities of meekness biblically, all right? You've got those images, but they're quite good. The first is a meek person waits on God. That, this is the worst one for me. So I don't like waiting on God. Meekness is all about God, first of all. And, you know, the Bible says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. You know, what do you do when things don't happen quick enough? What do you do? I make them happen myself. I get angry when things don't happen when I expect them to happen. I mean, I, I know some of you are in your own business. You know what it's like when, you, when you, you send out all these feelers to expand your business and it doesn't work? What do you do? You get mad. What do you do when you plan a weekend away to get refreshed or a vacation and then you go and it rains every day? What do you do? You wait up. You're mad. Because it just didn't happen, you know, now, and I need it now. And, you know, or you go for a pro this promotion is going on at work. But you know what? You didn't get it. Everyone got a raise. You didn't. Well, what's a meek person do? Well, there's some piece about this, it, patience and waiting on God. And for me, there's going to be five here. This is the biggest one for me. Um, because how many times I have rushed to make decisions, to do good, of course, but there was no rest in the decisions because I wasn't waiting on the Lord. I hadn't done that piece. I, I was just in a rush. Meek people are able to discern when am I being a doormat and when am I, call, when am I waiting on God? And it's that thin line between the two. But I am waiting on the Lord. I, I just love this. You know, this verse, you know, I do my offices. I, do, I try this one every day. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. It, Lord, it takes strength to wait for the Lord. It takes such strength to be meek, to not explode. I just almost finished reading Nelson Mandela's book, A Long Way Walk to Freedom. How many read that book? It's a fantastic book, A Long Walk to Freedom. It's his autobiography. Anyone I can think living today that is someone meek, I, I think Nelson Mandela, you know, walked it out. I mean, for, tw for 27 years, he was in prison from age 46 to 73. And he didn't see his mom, you know, when she died, couldn't go to the funeral. He didn't raise his children. He couldn't hold his wife's, he didn't touch his wife's hand for 21 years. And prior to age 46, um, he was in jail, you know, much of the time as well. But as you know, South Africa with apartheid was so bitterly divided, so full of hatred. And um, 
you know, this guy, he, he suffered, and he's so related to suffering, he really was a person who was broken in spirit. When he came out of prison after 27 years, the first thing he said was, I am not a hero, and I am not the Messiah. And uh, he claimed to be a Christian, you know, and, but he was power under control. If you read the book, his autobiography closely, even in prison, is one instance where he lost his control with a warden who was, who was provoking him. Started making some comments about his wife, your wife, Winnie, your wife, Winnie, you know. And at one moment, he just loses it, you know. And he just, he goes, he goes to his cell and he repents, you know. Because he, he said, I lost, that guy won me over. He was able to suck me in to his level. And um, as you know, I mean, when he came out of prison after 27 years, he saved South Africa from, from a horrific, bloody war. And he writes how he goes, I have no bitterness towards white people. And I'd be like, I have a lot of bitterness towards people. He goes, the system I do. But he says zero towards white people. And the guy was unbelievable in terms of poverty of spirit. But he was someone who mourned. You know that song? We sang what a, a wonderful cross earlier. And the words we sang, one of the lines was, ever such sorrow and love ever meet about Jesus. That's blessed are those who mourn and blessed are the meek. Sorrow and mourning. And Mandela knew a great deal of pain in his life. And people who are meek are people who have suffered well. I don't think we find meek people who haven't suffered. But as you know, some people suffer and become harder, more stubborn, more aggressive, and more bitter. Others suffer, bring that to God, and actually become soft, like a soothing medicine or a gentle breeze. Or like a horse, you just want to jump on that horse and ride it because you know they're so tame, they would never hurt a fly. So there's something here, I think a quality, just it begins by just just waiting on God. Jerry and I tried an experiment this week. We tried to teach our children after a fight how to be meek. Now think about what you're teaching your kids. So they had a fight, we said, all right, we're gonna be good parents. We're gonna we're gonna sit them down and we're gonna teach them meekness. It was a disaster. Okay, I mean it was a disaster. First of all, her and I started laughing. Because it was so ridiculous what they were fighting over. It was about power, about the couch. Who gets to sit on the couch? And we were just hysterical. It, was, it, was, it, was, it failed. It failed. It went so poorly. I mean, it's definitely, a, you know, it's a work of grace. You know, what are you going to say? But anyway, I'm sorry. I'm totally carried away. And uh, about waiting on God. Okay, number two. So here's again, waiting on God. Number two is non-defensive. Um, a, a meek person is not defensive. For example, I can... Can you admit it when you're wrong easily to anybody that you're wrong? Can you say, when's the last time you said, I'm sorry about that? Or can you go to others when you've made a mistake and admit it first? I mean, you're just just going first. You're not a doormat, but you recognize you messed up. Or when you're criticized and misunderstood, what do you do? Who likes being criticized? I think I have this big joke, you know, know, uh, Pete, that sermon stunk. You know, and oh, well, thank you. You know, <laughs> well, I could say, you know, you're an idiot, get out of this church, you know, and here's ten dollars, don't come back. Or you say, that, you know, well, what what was it about the sermon that was so terrible for you? That's a meek response. I can't say I gave that one, but that would have been a meek response. What what is it about the message that didn't go well for you? Or, or you know, I think you're a lousy pastor, Pete. No, okay, all right. What is it about me as a pastor that seems so lousy to you? Now, that would be a meek response without going home and quitting, right? But a meek would be, I have some strength. I've got some power in and of myself. I'm not a doormat, but I'm interested to hear what you have to say. It doesn't mean I accept it, but I'm open. Okay, then you go on. You know, appropriately assertive. You know, again, Jesus, remember, Jesus refers to himself as meek and humble of heart in Matthew 11:28. So Jesus overthrew the money changers. He basically, he didn't do what anybody wanted. He didn't do what his mom wanted. He didn't do what his family wanted. He didn't do what the 12 disciples wanted. He didn't do what the crowds wanted. He didn't do what the religious leaders wanted. I mean, the guy didn't do what anybody wanted. So he had a lot of spine and a lot of spunk. He did not have a doormat. He overthrew the the money changers. I mean, that, that was no joke to walk in the temple of Israel and overthrow people in their jobs. And he went up against the high priest. So myself, before I got into emotionally healthy spirituality, I think I was uh, not assertive, but I was, a, I was, the truth was I was a coward 
And the reason I didn't say anything was because I was really self-serving. I didn't want conflict or I didn't want you mad at me. So I was, I was meek. No, I wasn't biblically meek. I was a wimp and a coward. And the truth was it was about me, not about God. The reason I was being quiet. You see the difference? If you don't have a sense of who you are, you can't be meek. You're just a spineless doormat. Go ahead, roll over. You've got to have power to be meek. Moses had the power to wipe out Miriam and Aaron. Jesus had the power on the cross to call down 12 legions of angels and wipe them all out. He didn't. He waited on God. He was non-defensive, and he was appropriately assertive at the right moment. And uh, come on, how many of us, we say no. We say, so we want to do something? Yes, but we, we mean no. That's not meekness. Or when you're with a group of friends, and they're talking about a topic or gossiping, and you know you don't agree, but you're silent, and you're saying, I'm just being meek. No, you're not being meek. You're being a wimp. Don't pull God into that. You're being codependent, and that's not meekness. That's spineless. Meekness is to say something appropriately. Okay, because you're waiting on the Lord, and even if you lose a friend or two, it's not the end of the world. Meek people are strong people. All right, we can go on. You know, what do you want for dinner? Whatever. You know, I mean, you know, you may be that easy going, probably not. So you go to dinner wherever, and then you have an attitude. Okay, you're not meek. Okay, some of our personalities appear to be meek, or some cultures might appear to be meek. It's an illusion. Okay, meekness takes, you know, the grace of God. All right, let me go on here. I'm getting crazy. All right. <laughs> approachable. Meek people are approachable. You know what? Wouldn't you love to have a, a friend that's not touchy, that's not easily offendable, that when you hurt them, they forgive you, and you know they'll forgive you? Even when you, when, when you, re, you do something really nasty to them, but you know they're so broken, but they have a self, they don't, you know they're not going to retaliate. They're like a horse that's been broken. They're like a soothing medicine. They're like a gentle breeze. You're just, you're just so safe. I mean, do you realize some of you pay money to go to somebody to be meek for 45 minutes? A therapist, you know, who will not explode on you. I mean, it's good. We, have, it's good. we need therapists. We need good therapists. But um, the point is we're to be meek, who we are, so kind that we're just a pro. We, people know they can come to us about anything, and they're going to get a gentle breeze, not a hurricane. I don't know about you, but I like the upper hand. I don't know. And lastly, merciful. Like a merciful person is a, is, is a meek person is merciful. They don't hold grudges. Now, I don't know. I, you know, I think that we think we are more than we are. We don't see our total depravity. Moses, I think, was, had grieved his own sin and brokenness enough that he didn't give it to, you know, Miriam and Aaron. If we saw our ugliness and our depravity, we would, be pov- we would have poverty of spirit and we would mourn and we would be meek. I think the truth is we are un- under a lot of illusions about who we are. You know, again, you've heard Jerry and I quote this and, because Ken gave us the quote from the Desert Fathers. If you knew who was speaking to you right now and giving this sermon, you would run out the door. Like Paul says, I'm the chief of all sinners. All sinners on earth. He goes, I'm the chief. I'm number one. And so how could I not help but give mercy when you've stabbed me in the back? Because you know what? If I had a chance, I would have put two daggers in your back because I know who I am. And so there's a mercy that flows out. Even though I struggle with mercy, there's something that flows out of me. I, it's quite a list here. And, um, but meekness will flow. So as I've wrestled with it, so, so the question is, how do I become this? I, I look at this and I say, Lord, that's meekness? It's not me. I mean, that is, that's the kingdom of God. That's what we're supposed to be like as the family of Jesus. As we walk in the world, Jesus says, these people will inherit the earth. They're the gift to New York City. It may look like you'll get creamed if you live like this. He says, no, you don't get it. You will conquer the earth like Mandela did, like Moses did, like Jesus did, like David did with Saul. Blessed are the meek. And here's the promise. They will inherit the earth. You trust me on this. You wait on the Lord. Have courage and take heart and wait on the Lord. I promise you, you will inherit the earth. It may look like you're going to get crucified, but I promise you this, there's a resurrection after the crucifixion. So you trust me 
and you follow me, you are not to follow the world or the zealots around you. Poverty of spirit, you grieve, and meekness, and the earth is yours. So let me close with this. Oh, Lord, how do I do it? I don't know, but I'm preaching. i got to figure something out. No, I, how do I mature in meekness? <laughs> I really rather, how do I mature in this? Well, I think number one is awareness. And i, I got to ask myself, am I impatient? Yes. Am I defensive? Yes. Am I domineering or a doormat? Yes, yes. Am I difficult to approach? Often. Am I unforgiving? Often. Yeah, I mean, you got to just ask yourself and begin to get aware. Because if you're not aware, then you just continue living in this illusion that you're just a tremendous Christian, and the truth is you're just religious. And the world's not going to get blessed by religious people. It's going to get blessed by people who are filled with Jesus and who reflect their true kingdom values. So awareness, I think, really is stepping back. And it's painful. And I'll be honest, for me, the, the major application, I guess I can't get past number one, waiting on the Lord. I'm, so, I'm giving him so aware of that for me, of such a critical issue, because everything flows out of that. When I don't wait on the Lord, I take it out on people. I start, you know, all kinds of things flow out of that. I hate, so number two is, I, I, I think, is, is learning new Jesus family skills. If you look at the word meekness in James chapter 3, it's used in the context of wisdom, that you will know the meek by their, by their wisdom. And there are skills, I think, that we learn, and hopefully we're teaching here, about speaking in the eye, learning to be quiet, learning to listen well, all those things we're trying to t- speaking respectfully and clearly and appropriately. There are skills of meekness that I think we're trying to impart in our church here that are important. They're a piece of it, but even the first two aren't enough. The bottom line is number three is that I've got to somehow live in the experience of Jesus' meekness and love. And I've had this theme, and I want to hit it again here before we close. That is, we don't want a Christianity or a relationship with God that's in our head. We want a relationship with God that's in our experience, in our heart. It's both. My concern is that so many of us have a, a relationship with God that's in our head and not our experience. You cannot be meek because you will it in your head. It flows out of who you are. And Dallas Willard once said, you can't live like, you can't expect to respond in meekness at a certain moment when you're under pressure unless you've made a choice to live like Jesus with your whole life out of which he's transforming you. And so as we go to communion here, you know, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weak and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you you and learn from me, for I am meek, or the word is translated gentle, same word in Greek, I am meek and humble of heart. And I think we've got to live in the experience of Jesus's meekness and love for us and let it wash into us because most of us are not allowing his meekness or love to flow into us because we feel so bad about our lives. And if we don't let it into us and receive his love and live in that, we can't give it out to other people. You can only give out what you're experiencing. And so if you'd experience it, he's going to transform you. If he could change Moses from a murderer to a meek person, he can change me and you. He can change anybody. 